Tēnā koutou ngā mihi o te atu ki a koutou katoa, nei rā te kauhau a o te ipurangi tuatahi o tēnei tau, nō reira, nō mai hoki mai ki e tahi o koutou, nō mai tauti mai ki e tahi o koutou, kua haere mai ko tau mai nei ko tau mai tau mai tau. Tēnā koutou, he tino whakahirahira tēnei, he miharo māku ki te tū whakahihi ana hei kaua ngā kōrero mō te rā nei. Nō reira tēnei au, ko haria te tairaki o tēnei, e tū ana hei māngai mō tōi tangata i raru te kaupa mō tēnei rā, he āhua whakahirahira tēnei mō ku nā tūnea koi nei pākua nō whanahau. Nō reira, nō mai, tau tū mai, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora! Welcome to those who are joining in for the webinar, um, for this webinar service through Toi Tangata for the first time. And welcome back to those of you who are familiar with our service but are jumping back on for the year. Um, as I said, this is an exciting time, but I'll just go through a few housekeeping things. Um, lots of my presentation today is going to be a little bit different and then I'm going to share some stuff with you over on the whiteboard. So it's a little bit different and I'll be discussing a few subjects. Um, so there is a little bit of a presentation as you can see in the background there. But the point of this is that I really wanted to bring my research to, to life. So after this, you're gonna have an opportunity to actually um, get a hold of my literature review if you're interested and also my reflective um, report, I suppose, because I did uh, a bit of study into the associated literature and then applied it in, in, it, um, in a practical sense. So that's kind of going to be the, the real um, mooka or the, the in-depth part of, of it today. And what I wanted to do with this presentation was to kind of bring it to life and I suppose summarize some things that took me a long time to read and grasp with so that it is hopefully going to be useful for practitioners who work in a physical activity context. Okay, kia ora. To me, um, this is a greeting and I use it on a daily basis, but it also um, fundamentally is wishing the person you're, you're greeting to be well, to flourish in their wellness, to not only live their life, to, but to live it to its fulfillment. And recently I learned about this word called eudaimonia, which is a similar state, it's about being happy, and I want to talk about how that is relevant to being well. That's what I'm going to be discussing today. Okay, so I suppose this is what lots of people will be thinking. This flash, kupu, these um, different states of sports psychology and stuff like that. What, why is that relevant to me? So having a look here, what does living well and being happy have to do with positive continuation of Papa Papa? So I've added this question in here, mostly for myself, to make sure that I'm always being relevant to you guys. But in essence, this is my way of marrying what we're trying to do. This is a part of um, our vision in that we are able to positively contribute to the whakapapa of the communities, of the regions, of the whanau that we work with in order to make it a better tomorrow of sorts. So that's what that is about, and I'm going to continue to try and bring that in throughout the process. So I'm going to let that kind of just sit for a little bit and let people engage with that. So while that question is in the, the back of your mind, I'm going to discuss kind of why this came about, what I'm doing, and um, how I ended up here. So I initially started my study journey in the scientific side in sport and exercise science. I had a really um, satisfying journey learning about, I suppose, the chemical side that's going on inside of the body. And that helped provide an understanding of what was going on with mechanics. So basically I learned about how to make an athlete more athletic or something like that. And um, you, you learn to work with general populations at the same time. So I thought that that was um, quite gratifying. And that was all really helpful with my role here at Toi Tangata. But I also found that it didn't actually help me understand people better. There was still a lack of understanding when it came to my ability to work with people, to working with communities, to understanding what actually helps with their motivation or what is not helpful and how I could be a more effective practitioner. So that's where this study journey into sports psychology um, came to place. 
and um, I completed this bit of study last year and I um, kind of wanted to learn a whole lot. I did a, a lot of reading before I even came up with what I wanted to learn. I just did a lot of background research and I suppose I, um, I wanted to learn how to be more effective and to make a difference. So from then on, I, I used my literature understanding and applied it in a practical setting to see what worked. It was a bit of a fun time with me where I was able to use some of my philosophies, some of my ideas that I haven't had um, as much of an opportunity to have a tutu with. And this is kind of what came about. So I thought, why not share it where it could be um, helpful? Okay, so first of all, these are the, the main kind of subjects I'm going to go through. We're going to talk about what happiness is and looking at that flash word there, that eudaimonia. So we're going to look about at the difference between eudaimonia and hedonism, how they are relevant, how they are related, but how they are also contrasting in the essence. I'm going to move on to talk about three of more like the... Uh, the really helpful pieces of literature or bodies of literature that helped me to kind of formulate what I wanted to know, what was really relevant to me, and kind of bring them out into a more practical setting so that you as a listener can actually understand what that looks like. Because as I found throughout the process, there was often a disconnect between what literature was saying and how people can use that or what that actually looks like in the real life. So that's what that will be about. I'm going to talk about the motivation continuum, basic psychological needs and reflective practice. The reflective practice area is just going to be talking about what I used and why it was helpful for me. I know that lots of um, possibly the, the workforce out there that does stuff, especially with um, addictions, um, s smoking, drug and alcohol will have a lot of experience, much more than I do. So I'm just going to be discussing what I did with this. And finally, I'm going to talk about how actually this form of eudaimonia is uh, used in practice, what that looks like and things like that. Okay. Okay, so happiness. It seems like a little bit of a, a funny thing to discuss, I think, and maybe it, it's just so inherent that we don't really discuss what it is, but essentially it is the, um, the feeling or the pursuit or the, the essence of pleasure, the, um, the lack or the absence of um, negative affect or not feeling so well, and um, it can come about in a few different settings. So there are two main things we're going to be talking about, eudaimonia. And hedonism. First of all, let me jump on over to my trusty whiteboard and I can give you a little bit of a story, a little bit of a journey to follow along with so it doesn't seem so technical. Okay, starting with eudaimonia. Eudaimonia. So if we have a look at this little uh, picture here, let's consider this as a bit of a smile. It's a little bit cheesy. Um, as I said, we're talking about happiness, so it has to kind of be in there from one side or the other. But this one here, we're going to pretend that this is a waka. This is a waka. This is our eudaimonic waka. And on the outside, so the the um, the walker itself has a hull inside. Inside this walker, one of the most significant components is that it is concerned with self-reflection. Self-reflection is what I've written down here. So. This waka or this state, so the pursuit of eudaimonia, is someone who is engaged with themselves. They have an understanding, they're constantly re-evaluating the content of their life 
And I suppose with that, that means taking on board criticism or having moments um, where they have an understanding that things need to be worked on or things just need to be evaluated. So self-reflection, being self-reflective is one really important component of eudaimonia. There are two more. Let's move on. The second one here is the outside. We're going to think of this as the outside of the locker. It is engaging with the best self or their best sense of self. So this is the fact that, uh, I suppose in a simple form, this person is trying to strive to be their best then. Hariata is trying to be the best Hariata she can be in their own unique way. So it's a, a really important thing that people are an expression of their authentic self, that they're not trying to be as good as their older brother, that they're not trying to pursue their, their footsteps of just their tipuna to be like their tipuna. They're trying to be themselves at the same time that they're also understanding this development in that process. And finally, the third important component of eudaimonia is that it's autonomous. So I like to think of this as the sale. The sale is a little bit out of proportion with my waka, but the sale behind the boat or the motivator for why this waka is in motion. As you may see, every word here, every setting or component here has the word self in it because it's unique to each person. So this, in this setting here is self-directed. So it's uh, another expression that that person is pursuing this state or pursuing happiness because it's what they want. They're not doing it because somebody else has instructed them to or they think that they'll make somebody else happy. It's uniquely an expression of that person. So just to recap that, there are three components of eudaimonia. That person is um, engaged with a self-reflection, that they're um, understanding the content of their life. The second part, that they are engaged with becoming or pursuing their best self. So it's an authentic representation of their identity. And then finally, that it is self-directed, they are autonomous within this pursuit and that they do it for themselves. So this is eudaimonia. Hedonism, I'm going to spell that, I'm going to write that down for you above here because we're going to be talking about something a little bit different. Hedonism. So hedonism is also... Um, being happy, but I suppose where this is different is that hedonism is that feeling, it's the pleasure itself. So I talked about how both of these words are to do with happiness, but eudaimonia is kind of the pursuit or the journey in which happiness happens, but that sometimes it's a little bit different, whereas hedonism is just that pleasure, it's just the good feeling, it's the outcome. So there's the journey and the outcome. Eudaimonia is the journey, hedonism is the outcome. So I'll give you another little, uh, another little picture diagram so you can kind of understand this. Okay, this is a smile. This is a, the smile's a little bit smaller because we've got a little bit of a, a different thing going on here. We'll give this guy, um, we'll give this guy a face. Okay, so lots of you are probably thinking, what the heck is that? So just to make it clear, this is a boy. Um, I wanted to keep in the same theme as the waka, but to kind of help you see the difference. So this boy represents hedonism. He's happy. He's definitely happy, and it's noticeable. Just like in the water, when you see a boy, you notice it and you um, acknowledge it. But just as it's different to a waka, this boy is... Um, a state that is kind of fluid and it will just stay there. So you're likely to journey past a, um, past a boy, but the boy will stay in that state. 
it will be, be um, stuck there. So with that, there is a, a lack of understanding. There's a lack of understanding on the boy's part of being able to move, of being able to do something. It just wants to stay there. It just wants to stay in that position and be happy. So that's the first part, lacking in understanding. So this boy is lacking of understanding. It's not seeking for depth or engaged with the content of itself or its life. It's just doing its thing. So with that, <clears throat> A hedonistic pursuit is also shallow, and if the the main point is to be happy, it often avoids the truth. So we've got a little bit of a, a, a tie here. At the bottom of the seafloor, there is a, a little bit of a rock or an anchor. And I'm going to call that the truth because sometimes when someone's seeking a hedonistic approach, they are avoiding the truth. That the main pursuit is to be happy. Okay, so just to recap over the components um, of each of those settings, basically eudaimonia is the pursuit of happiness, and that sometimes. Actually, the pursuit of sustainable happiness will bring states of hedonism, or sorry, that outcome, that feeling of happiness, but that sometimes it will also bring a feeling of um, difficult times, that things are hard or a lack of that because you have to go through those processes to be happy in a sustainable way. So they are also seeking the truth, not avoiding the truth, and doing something in their own approach. So they're seeking their best self, a form of self-reflection along the way, and that the whole journey is self-reflected, the self-directed, sorry, self-directed, and that they're pursuing something that's an expression of the authentic self, whereas a hedonistic approach has a lack of understanding, so it's shallow, it may avoid the truth, and it's all about that feeling, about that outcome. So they're both concerned with happiness, but in very different ways. <laughs> very different ways. Okay. Don't have any questions so far. So we're going to move on. <coughs> there are those, um, those main points I gave to you. Obviously, these are really brief little messages um, because you can get a larger understanding if you're uh, interested in the literature review I mentioned. So, yeah. One, being uh, eudaimonic, or eudaim, um, a state of eudaimonia, is striving to be the best version of yourself. Being self-aware and engaged with the content of yourself. So evaluating, understanding, getting feedback. And finally, being autonomous with that, uh, throughout the pursuit. Okay, let's talk about these three things. They seem, uh, they may seem a little bit intense or I suppose new subjects and so I'm going to go through each of them with examples to kind of make it make a little bit more sense. Let me just clear the board. Motivation. For any practitioners who have ever worked with people, I can uh, guarantee that working with motivation or understanding motivation has been a difficult task and it's a constantly challenging thing in that people are complex. Understanding the people you work with is, is not always easy and um, it's varied. There's no one size that fits all. And this is no way my, um, sorry, my goal is no way to kind of 
give you an answer that fits them all, but actually to help you identify where people may be because we're going to be discussing the motivation continuum. So this is a, a whole lot of the information that has come through the so motivation um, academics, mostly Deci and Ryan. And this may help you to understand where exactly the people you're working with or the client that you have can be um, approached so you can understand where the next step is. Okay, so the motivation continuum has five main steps, but the first one you must understand that's kind of separate to that is a motivation. A motivation. Someone who is a motivated means there is nothing. It means they're not going to engage with anything at all. So say, for example, your goal is to get people to engage with drinking more water on a regular basis. This person is not even in the room. They're not engaged with the group. They're not going to come along, and there's no way they're going to do it. And actually, sometimes those are um, ways of describing someone who's not there yet, someone who's not able to engage, or someone who just simply wants. So a motivation, that's one space. <clears throat> Moving on from here, we're gonna talk about people in varying degrees of that they are engaged with the program or with um, a practitioner, but where they may actually be. So as I said, there are five within this scale or this continuum. The first one is an externally motivated person. We're gonna put them here. They're at this side of the spectrum. So an externally motivated person. How about I give you an actual example? We're going to talk about one person and how they may move along. So say, for example, there is a workplace boot camp of sorts, or there's a workplace exercise initiative, and it's um, imperative. Everybody who works there has to go Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning. It's paid by the workplace, but it's also essential to their role. So for that reason, as someone who is engaging with that exercise kind of program, they would be externally motivated because they don't have a choice. They have to do it. So an externally motivated person is engaging with um, this pursuit, this exercise pursuit, because their employer said so. Moving on. We'll move the spectrum over a little bit. and talk about an introjected, introjected uh, motivation or an introjected, regulated form of motivation. So this is kind of step two, one point along. So an introjected form of motivation, we'll go back to that person who's engaged with that, um, that same kind of boot camp, and an introjected form of motivation would see that um, say perhaps this program continues, but the, the employer says that I'm still going to pay for you to do this boot camp to all the employees. Maybe it's been a month and they're really happy with how people in the workplace are actually generally in a bit of a better mood or something like that. And so they say, we're still going to pay for this, but you don't have to go anymore. It's not imperative that all the employees go. So from that form, if this person chose to stay within this program, this would be introjected in that they feel like a little bit of a sense of guilt. They kind of don't want to do it still, but their boss is paying for it and everybody else is doing it. So that's it. Or they feel a sense of relief, relief because maybe they'll feel as though their boss is going to say, hey, why aren't you engaging with this thing I'm paying for? So that's a little bit of a different feeling. They're not doing it because they have to, but they feel like something inside that makes them do it. That's interjected motivation. Moving on. The next point or the third step is that it is an identified form of motivation. So say this is month number two, 
The first month saw that this person engaged in the boot camp because they had to. The second month saw that they did it because they felt like a sense of guilt. So the second month, they're like, oh, the boss is paying for it. I better do it. This third month is that this person actually starts thinking, you know what, I actually value this. I value the time I spend with my work colleagues. I value being active and I value looking after myself. So they're starting to value the benefits, but they still, I suppose, say engaging with the activity because they see something coming out of it. So that is an identified form. This, uh, let's move on to the next one or the fourth step, which is an integrated form of regulation or motivation. So this is almost the last step, and I really want to draw lots of attention to this. So an integrated form of regulation for motivation and anything you want to do. This is where, I suppose, in the same example, this person um, talks about the boot camp or the exercise that they're doing because they feel like that's who they are. There is, they are someone who believes in being active, being fit. I'm a fit person, so this is what I do. And my main criticism is that in this point here is where most people actually stay. Most people stay in this state because in a contemporary setting, being active or having a gym membership or doing something on a planned setting is really common. It's really common now for people to engage with it. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's a bad thing, but that's where exercise practitioners will lead their clients or their communities and get them to stay in that state. And to an extent, it's not sustainable. This is not a sustainable form. It's still positive. Being engaged with something is positive, but it's really helpful to understand that this is not the final setting. There's one more, and that is intrinsic motivation. So this is the final part, intrinsic motivation. Someone who's intrinsically motivated, so say we go back to that boot camp example, they are engaged with the boot camp because it feels good. So say, for example, they are outside and sometimes they have run up a hill to do the activity. The feeling of running up that hill is something that they are enjoying. They like being in the park. That the, point of the fact that, say, for example, some of it is swimming, I don't know, some boot camps might swim as well, they enjoy the feeling of the water. So if you see there, this actually has nothing to do with having to do the reps, the repetitions, or the sets, or the activity itself. It's about the feelings within the activity. Being with people, engaging with your teammates, if we're talking about the setting, that's an intrinsically motivated person. So intrinsically motivated for that particular activity. And this is where an exercise practitioner um, and what congruent with best practice ought to help facilitate their clients or the, the whānau they're working with or the communities they're working with to be in. This is a state that would be ideal and this is a state that's also sustainable. So moving along, a motivation is the, the fact that people aren't engaged at all. Starting with an externally motivated person whereby they were engaging with the activity because the boss told them to. Moving on, an interdicted person, they feel that sense of guilt if they don't do it, or actually when they do do it, they feel relieved, interdicted. Moving on, an identified person, they start to see the value in the activity, but it's still just, I run 10Ks because at the end I feel good. Finally, an integrated form is, like I said, what most people commonly do today. It's just not what everybody does, but it's also really important to be able to identify that, that people do that because they think that's who they are. That I'm a fit person, this is why I do this thing. And finally, an intrinsically motivated person is someone because running feels good because Walking up a mountain helps you to see the view because swimming in an hour or an ocean helps you feel the water or you love the feeling of gliding. That's an intrinsically motivated person. Okay, we've got a few more things to go on to, so we're going to move on. Looking at basic psychological needs, or well, I'm going to move on to calling them BPNs. 
BPNs, basic psychological needs. Let me just rub this stuff off the board so we can move on. BPN. Okay, so this is um, by far just a little kind of summary of some um, psych the psychology st uh, literature and uh, motivation psychology. But we're going to be looking at um, three major components. They are autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Autonomy, competence, and relatedness. <coughs> Let me just write those down. Okay, all three of these subjects or these components are necessary for the basic satisfaction of every person. So um, inside psychology kind of research for every human, it's innate and it is required that people satisfy these three needs in every component of their life in order to be functional, in order to kind of work well and if there are parts that aren't working, um, a sense of being unhappy or not progressing will come along. So I'll just kind of describe them basically so you can get an understanding of what each term means and then I'll try and give you some examples. So autonomy, we've already talked about this a little bit today because it's um, congruent with eudaimonia, but autonomy is that somebody is in charge of what is happening. They feel like they have control over it, that there is um, a situation they are in from their own choices, okay? So already I can tell that people will be thinking, oh, sometimes autonomy is not possible at all, and that's true, but this is what people seek in their own lives um, in a, <clears throat> an inherent form to be able to kind of live sustainably and be happy. Finally, um, we'll, oh, sorry, no. Next is um, relatedness. So this is um, really important. Um, for people, and I suppose um, from a Māori setting, we kind of value this um, really strongly as well. Whanaunga tanga, whaka whanaunga tanga, connecting with people, being related to people. So it's a sense of having a reciprocal nature or relationship with the people who are important to you, that not only uh, you are you serving or you are <coughs> participating to a group or to other people, but also that that's um, given to you that people look after you and you're, um, you're important. So it is uh, innate and important for humans to feel connected to other humans. I know this might seem basic, but it's, um, it's worth mentioning. And finally, confidence. Sometimes this is considered self-efficacy as well. Confidence is that somebody feels a sense of accomplishment, a sense of mastery over... Um, a certain <clears throat> a behavior or something that they pursue in. So these are um, kind of really broad subjects that can help understand a, a triangulated approach to how things work out. So confidence, this is that somebody, um, say for example, if they were in um, an employment setting, that they have a role because it has something to do with their ability that they have respect from their employer and that they will be able to complete the job, but also a really good working relationship with their um, fellow colleagues to get the job done. And finally, that this job per se, or this career or whatever vocation they're in, something that they do of their choosing. They're not an accountant because their father and their father's father was an accountant. That they choose to be an accountant because that's congruent with them. That's who they are. So those are basic psychological needs um, talked about in a, a very brief setting, but they'll kind of help um, form or help support an understanding of why I studied what I did. Finally, um, reflective practice. Um, <clears throat> let me just draw a little bit of a diagram for you.
I used a triangulated approach. There's a bit of a triangle theme going on here. So I um, studied components of reflective practice that would help me for my piece of research, and I used three forms. The first thing I did was uh, once I engaged in this relationship with a client, I wrote diaries. I wrote diaries of what was happening practically. You know, we met at this time, at this place, and this is the activity that we did because I was working with them in a physical activity relationship. Um, and I also noted down that I think this went well, or I, I'm not sure how this person perceived this thing, or I addressed this task, or I talked about this activity, or we tried this thing that was new, and I talked about how that felt. So I did that with throughout the process. So the first one was a diary. The second thing I did was um, uh, after kind of like the whole journey or um, after we'd finished all the physical activity stuff, we had um, an interview. So I, I, did a, a, I held a guided interview with my client and asked questions about various parts of the activity and so that I could get an understanding of what they thought, what they worked out and how that connected to what I had written in my diary. So we had an interview. And then finally, I had a dyadic approach. So a dyadic approach is talking throughout the process. So when we were in an activity, I would often ask this person how they felt. What did it feel like? How difficult was it? What was going on? So I had a diet. And so this reflective practice or this way of evaluating and engaging with what we were doing, what I used in the end to triangulate, to connect up all the pieces to see actually what was I perceiving, what was I learning and doing, how was that person engaging with it, was there a disconnect between those things and what I could do to learn from those parts. So I had a diet, an interview and a diary throughout the process. Okay, now I want to describe what I actually did in my in my research for the, the last five minutes, just to kind of discuss how it worked out and how I used Eudaimonia. So this flash sentence at the bottom was kind of like my research question. My goal, per se, was um, to facilitate a sustainable an independent satisfaction of basic psychological needs through activity, through physical activity, sorry. So as I said, I was um, interested in understanding how to be a better physical activity practitioner. Um, I wanted to be able to help satisfy those basic psychological needs or those innate needs that every human is um, seeking or required, and that's according to psycho uh, psychology literature and that I wanted to better my goal facilitating, so not leading, not telling, not instructing, to be there in that support so that some person could do something sustainably and independently so that they could do it themselves. Essentially, my goal was to help work alongside someone or to work with people and that um, eventually my goal is to be superfluous, to be able to help teach people things or facilitate um, a time of behavior and activity with people so that eventually people can step off themselves and do it on their own. Okay, so what did I do? I, um, I had this as my overarching goal and I pulled out little goals out of that. So one of them was that I actually wanted this person to feel good about themselves, to learn, to gain an understanding of their physical abilities, but to, to know it and to feel safe and secure within themselves um, irrelevant of whether they got um, mountains of loads fit. I just wanted them to understand that their abilities were sufficient. And so we did all sorts of things where I, um, I challenged them, but I also positively reinforced their behavior with a reason. Like you did well because of you couldn't do that last week or you, um, you just smashed your own goal. Good on you. So I learned that giving compliments where that person doesn't understand 
where that compliment comes from is not as useful as it could be if you <clears throat> if you gave them a reason. And that sometimes maybe their goal was here and they reached here, but still the fact that they wanted to get up to that point may have been a bigger jump than if they had been here in the beginning. So talking about the fact that actually you wanted to get to a, a seven today and previously you've only done a three, so that's a massive jump, but be really proud of your five because that's what's important. So I used that and um, within my interview, I, I found out that she, not only um, my, the person I worked with was a woman, um, not only did she feel fitter, but she also kind of knew that that was the fittest she had been or that she felt the strongest. Um, the next part was having that person being self-endorsing or understanding that that was them. As I said, she talked about herself being um, fitter. Um, she talked about an expression of her best self and that she um, hadn't done some of the activities before, that she really enjoyed the change. Um, and one really kind of significant part of my research that I found out very much at the end, so I had a general relationship, I got feedback throughout it, but I found out one thing was that um, as a, like an offset or a, a side comment, my, my client talked about the fact that um, she'd just taken up walking from work, she'd park her car a whole lot further away from work to walk, to take that time to be able to engage with herself, to reflect on things, and she just walked. And um, that was kind of a little bit of a, a jackpot or exciting time for me because she didn't understand that she, uh, she did understand that she, that she needed that. And um, I think she just didn't understand that that's what I really wanted to hear. So that was really exciting for me to, to learn about that. Um, so she had an understanding of what she was doing. Um, she understood her ability or saw strength and ability, confidence in herself, but she also found some techniques to build on her personal self, or I suppose her non-physical self, through physical activity, through going for those walks. Um, yeah, so that's what I found out about it. I suppose the, the kind of important things I want to discuss about what I set up in, um, in the research, because sometimes it, I suppose I, I feel like I'm talking about all these things that I did and lots of it just happened and it had to do with this person I was working with. Um, <clears throat> there are only a few things that I made really important um, in the training relationship. The first time, first thing was that I used the environment. The environments that we trained in was something that I did deliberately and they changed. Every session was in a different place and sometimes they were inside, sometimes they were outside. And so one really important feature was that whether it was something that didn't contribute negatively to any of the sessions. If we had planned to be outside and it rained, we still went outside. If we had planned to be inside in a gym, gym setting to use that setting, and it happened to be really hot that day, we still went to that setting. So we, we use different environments for what they're used for. So we use them as tools, and I suppose um, another vision or another view of this is lots of trainers, especially in a, like a a personal training setting, use gyms um, as a determinant. But they, the, the gym itself determines what happens. Um, so that's one kind of tip I can give people is to use the environment that's ready to you or that's available and make sure that that's a tool that can enhance the environment, enhance the session of the day and enhance the whole training kind of journey. <coughs> the next thing that I did that um, I'm, I'm a big advocate for, and I didn't learn this at university, and this is uniquely my philosophy, is that I don't use measurement in a um, traditional form. So everything that we were doing, sometimes we were, say, for example, squatting with a certain weight. We had an understanding of that, but there was no technical goal aligned with that other than one session may be about power. So we did what we could to form that. But I often worked with the intensity or the, the level of energy, I suppose I would call this modi, within my client to have an understanding of where to place it. So sometimes I would assign tasks or activities and I would time it for my own understanding to see if she could go faster, to see if she could do more. But she didn't have an understanding. She was simply required to work 
at her best. And I would often ask her within that process, how does it feel? What do you need to change? What's going on? So I didn't use measurements. That's something that lots of trainers do, and I'm not saying it's, um, it's something not to do, but I, I um, engage with working with her best ability or her best self or highest intensity. Um, another thing that I did with throughout the, um, <clears throat> the journey as I engaged with the relationship, I tried to build a relationship with this person, and um, I suppose that would take me out of before we have the continuum, that external motivator, the external regulator setting that's here because I didn't want to be the reason why this person worked hard. So it's always hard to change that because essentially if you're a practitioner, if you're a kaimahi, if you're a community health worker, you're already at a level that's different to the people you're working with. So you can't always change that. That was my goal, I engaged in a relationship. Sometimes I talked to her about things that had nothing to do with activity because I wanted to gain some trust, I wanted to gain some understanding, and I wanted to find a level playing field where it didn't feel like there was a little bit of power from my setting and lacking or inferior from her. I wanted to bridge that gap and bring it close together. So um, I found out that that was working, or I learned about that in an interview, where she, um, she talked about um, trusting me and talked about um, doing things that she wouldn't usually have done before because of her, um, <clears throat> because of our relationship. And finally, the, the, the last thing I'd say that I put into, that I made deliberate in this journey is that I made it individual. I think every person, every group you're gonna work with is gonna be completely different and I've definitely found this, but I found ways to express ourselves, our relationship, and um, my kind of techniques as a, as a person in itself for it. So to kind of wrap up how I use eudaimonia um, in this process, I engage with the reflective self or understanding oneself throughout the process by asking her questions about how she felt, asking things, engaging with um, evaluative questions in the activity. The second thing I did was just pushed, pushed really hard, used intensity as I said, didn't use numbers, but pushed really hard and um, kept it safe in that she had um, an understanding of when to say no or what was going to be too much, but really pushed ability to help her gain an understanding of her self-confidence. And um, finally, I um, found this a challenge because I also try to give um, and set aside an art or um, a space where they felt like they could choose activities or choose different things that they're doing. I try to facilitate autonomy and I didn't know what was going on and sometimes when I gave too many choices it didn't work out. And I keep writing this in my notes. It wasn't until the end of the whole journey that I found out that this person engaging with this environment or this whole um, relationship with me was a macro satisfaction, so on a larger scale, was her macro satisfaction of, um, <clears throat> of autonomy because she chose to engage in that relationship with me. So she often didn't want to have choices to have autonomy within the training itself. So um, on a whole, there's been a lot of information and I'm sure that there will be um, various questions about how this can work out. But like I said, <coughs> the sustainable pursuit of eudaimonia, those three components, if that can be utilized within physical activity relationship, any kind of relationship will help with the innate settings of happiness or wellness, even though there are times that are difficult, having an understanding of the basic psychological needs to see where things will be tweaked, because as I described, there were three main components, and sometimes two are working well and one's an outlier. <coughs> Understanding that scale, that motivation scale, that people can be along various components. And say someone is intrinsically motivated for physical activity, they might not be like that for employment. And that's okay, but as a, as a kaimahi or a facilitator, understanding where that person is is really important to help kind of facilitate a change. And that, um, yeah, Māori communities are very different as well, so lots of these these pieces of literature are from a non-Māori setting, but they are relative. 
things like um, whanaunga tanga, really important, rangatira tanga with autonomy, and then being that best self is kind of like the uh, lots of whakatauki that we use in a general setting, whaiate tikahurangi, was very congruent with what our tipuna did and not as well, uh, not um, as prevalent today, but it's very much a Māori um, setting at the same time. I think I'm going to stop. I think I'm going to stop talking and open up the um, the field if anybody has any questions. I understand there's been a lot of um, courted or discussed, so people might just be sitting there going, <sighs> but um, kia ora, tēnā koutou. Thank you for listening. I'm going to hang around for a bit and see if any questions come through. Okay, we have a question. Chat. Ah, kia ora Bodhi. Nga mihi kia koe hoki. I hope it was helpful. <laughs> Um, kia ora, kia ora awesome, thank you for tuning in, I'm just getting props guys, you guys are just going to make me feel too cool, <laughs> um, okay, we don't have any major questions, okay, tēnā koutou, ngā mihi mō o taringa i ariani mai ki au i raro i te kōrero nei, I nga putake o tēnei kauhau, no reira ngā mihi kia koutou. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Um, I really enjoyed being able to share some of my information. I know that some of my ideas are here and there, so I may have taken you on a little bit of an up and down journey. So if you have any questions, I'm really happy to field those afterwards. Okay, that's enough from me. Kia ora.